This episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast is another one of our Women in Civil Engineering episodes. And in this episode, I have two female presidents of two civil engineering companies in Texas on at the same time. And they're going to give us some of the steps that they took to become presidents of their firms. And not only that, but they're also going to give some career advice and strategies for you becoming a productive, successful civil engineering professional. Let's jump right in. All right, now I'm excited to welcome our guests to today's episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast. That's right, I said guests. I have two guests with me today. I have Julia Harrod. Julia is the president of MWM Design Group, and I have Bonnie Moss with us as well. And Bonnie is the president of MBCO Engineering, and they're both leading women in the civil engineering field in the state of Texas, so I thought it'd be nice to have them both on together. And I'm going to let each one of them introduce themselves here in a moment. But first of all, I just want to welcome you both to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Thank you. All right. So, Julia, let's start with you. Why don't you just give us a quick overview, just a quick rundown of your firm, size, the type of work you do, and a little bit about your background. Yeah. So, we're a multidiscipline firm. We've been in business since 1980. Um, I've actually been with the firm since 1990. I started as a drafts person and worked my way up. Um, actually started here before I even got my engineering degree. So my first degree is in architecture from MIT. Um, I have a, a bachelor's there, and then I got my master's at UT Austin in engineering after working here at the company as a drafts person for a couple of years. Um, then became a PE, a project manager, principal, uh, eventually took over as president. Uh, we are, like I said, a multidiscipline firm, so having that multidiscipline background has been really beneficial. Uh, we provide architectural, landscape architecture, surveying, civil engineering, and permitting services, uh, mostly in Central Texas, about a 75-mile radius around Austin. We're about 50 people. Okay, great. So you went from that architectural background, then mm -hmm. you switched in over to civil engineering. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Bonnie, how about you? Oh, that's an awesome story, Julia. Um, so I've been in the industry about 23 years. Um, MBCO Engineering has been around about four and a half years. We have um, about 27 employees. And um, like Julia's company, we're a multidisciplinary, but mainly focus on government agency type work, um, tech dot counties, local municipalities, uh, designing roadways, uh, traffic, transportation, large diameter waterline design. We also have a surveying component to our company too. Um, like I said before, I've been in the industry about 20, 22 years and yeah, just worked up the ranks, just, you know, engineering training, became a PE project manager. Um, and then at some point we kind of decided to just jump out and, and do our own thing. And here we are today. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So, so Bonnie, kind of going along those lines, you are one of the founding partners of MBCO and I know that a lot of our listeners are aspiring to be presidents of a company or owner in a firm. And I know that it's, you know, it, it appears to be very glamorous, which I'm sure it is in a lot of ways. Um, but I'm sure that there's ups and downs that go along with it. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your experience as kind of um, one of, you know, someone responsible for building kind of the, the company from the ground up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we started from scratch, and it's it's funny you say that because everybody thinks that the president has the most glamorous title. And what I always say to that is, well, it's it's a lot of responsibility. Um, I would say business ownership, you know, yes, it has its ups and ups and downs. But at the at the beginning of starting a company, you know, we're four and a half years in. It's it is the way of life, ups and downs. And so once you accept that and don't get caught up in the whirlwind or drama um, and, you, and you just don't let it beat you down. Uh, and understanding that you're, you're in this for the long game and you have to keep that ultimate goal in sight. Some of the, some of the downs is it's a lot of hard work, lots of hours, you give up some free time, maybe lack of steady income. You know, you're the, you're the rainmaker among other things and there's a lot of stress, but the great thing is that you have, you know, independence, you can kind of control your own destiny, opportunity. And what's phenomenal is that you get to help the, the local economy by employing folks. 
And that's, uh, that's the greatest thing. Yeah, that is great. And I like really hearing, you know, Bonnie talk about those things. I think they're important for, you know, civil engineers to think about those that are, and not, you don't have to be owning your own firm, but even getting to partner and having, you know, shares in the company and thinking about things like that. I mean, like everything, there's some risks associated with things, there's benefits associated with things. Um, but I, I like that. I like thinking about it as, you know, if you go, know going into it that you're in for a little bit of a roller coaster, then you can try to still stay focused on your goals and objectives, even as the kind of roller coaster is going up and down. So I think that that's a really great way to frame it out. So Julia, being being that we've kind of talked about, you know, this idea of it being hard, but also being rewarding. Mm-hmm. I know that in, you know, reading a little bit about you and, and what you've done with your firm, you've you recognize the, you know, the stresses in the world of engineering today and you've tried to, you try to do some things in the workplace to try to help, I don't know, you know, alleviate or help people to deal with that and still be able to have a life that they are happy to live outside of work and a, and a, and a happy life at work. So can you talk about that a little bit, that philosophy? Yeah, that's really, uh, it's really important to me. It's very important to our, to our firm. I think, um, and you know, Bonnie can attest to this. I mean, it's it's not an easy job. Uh, we put our heart and souls into engineering. I mean, it's a higher calling, if you will. Uh, we're serving the greater good, the greater public with our projects, and I think you know people always have that in mind. So when you've got um, unreasonable deadlines, you you do everything you can to meet them, and and that can take a real toll um, on you emotionally, physically, your family, your, everything else. So. It's really important to us that people have some outlet, not only you know, being sure that there's a good work-life balance and they have time on their own to go take care of things that they need to take care of, but also to be sure that at the office that we're providing a really good atmosphere for them to work, to work in. So that means being sure that we're, we place a really high priority on our connectivity with each other, how we treat each other. Um, and also just being able to take um, breaks in the office. So we have a variety of different things that people can do from chess to ping pong to there's a massage chair in my wellness room. They can walk around the office. We play board games. Uh, We have a lot of different activities so people can have a little bit of downtime so their brain can rest a little bit and get back, you know, refreshed when they're actually working. But also I find that being able to um, interact with each other on something other than a project really helps when it comes to the stress of a deadline on a project. So that's mm. a couple of the things that we do intentionally to be sure people have that downtime. That's great. So what I want to kind of ask both of you about, cause I'm sure it's something that a lot of civil engineers think about maybe cause they want to be a president or, or executive or a leader one day is, you know, your time management. I think that as you grow in your career, um, if you're not paying attention to that, in other words, when you're younger as an engineer, you're doing a lot of design work. You know, there's no questions as to what you should be working on. It's very clear cut. But as you get into the positions that you're both at, your time to the growth of the company is extremely important and valuable and where you're focusing it is extremely probably valuable and directly related to the growth of the firm. And so I'll start with you on this one, Julia, just thinking about it, it really simple, at, you know, to, to, to think about it is how do you kind of think about where you spend your time or when you come to the office each day or each week, what kind of a process or how are you thinking about where your, where your uh, efforts need to be that day or week? Yeah. So um, Anthony, that's really perceptive of you. I find I'll, I'll answer it in kind of a, a sort of roundabout way. My, my method is pretty specific to me. Um, I have a weekly plan that I set out. I close out my week and I open out my next week in terms of being sure I've gotten everything done and line up my priorities for the week. And then every day I come up with a plan for the day. And I just intentionally be sure that I'm touching the different projects and the different aspects of the firm that I need to be doing on a daily, weekly basis. And without that, you're right, it's very easy to get distracted by something and leave um, some of these bigger projects um, off the table. Because I don't have somebody, I don't have a client calling me on a deadline um, for our strategic initiatives for the firm, for instance. That's all me trying to be sure I get that done. But but one thing that I notice um, in general in our profession, the things that make you successful as an EIT are not the same things. Well, they're pretty close to the things that will make you successful as a project engineer. But once you go from project engineer to project manager, 
to supervisor, those skill sets and very specifically that time management piece is a big one that um, it just changes with those different positions and being able to have some different tools at your disposal is really helpful because what worked for you as an EIT where you're kind of being spoon fed a lot of your tasks is not the same thing that works for you when you're supervising five or six people um, as a group lead or if you're president of a firm. So, so basically for you, it's really like a week to week process that you use to try to make sure you're, you're focused on the right efforts. Oh, well, that's, that's what I use to focus. You asked like on a daily basis. Right, on a basis. daily basis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also have a yearly plan and I, and I review that quarterly, come up with our quarter, my quarterly goals for myself relative to my projects. And then those I feed into those weekly plans. Great, great. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty robust system for me. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure it has to be for, for, for you know, leaders, firms, when everything is really, you know, dependent on, on you, <laughs> really, which is no other way to say it. But so, Bonnie, how about you? How does it look for you in terms of trying to figure out where you really need to focus your time and energy on a, on a regular basis? I loved hearing Julia. She sounded very organized and, you know, um, and I admire that. <laughs> um, but you know, they, this as the saying goes, you, is you don't know what you don't know. And you have an engineer that decides to start a business and then all of a sudden you've got to toss the balls of, oh, invoicing and um, projects, getting them out, um, finance, this, that, and the other. And so it's been a learning process. So I've slowly been evolving to getting organized into what my day and my week and my month my year looks like. Um, I guess I would say that as a new firm at four and a half years, cash flow is always an issue. So I always have the rule of thumb of whatever's closest to the dollar is what I pay attention to pretty quick. Um, so, you know, um, analyzing the finances uh, and marketing and business development is probably first and foremost. And then I'll go down and making sure things are, in, our team is running the way it should be operational wise. Now we do get together and we, we have our goals for the, the quarter and, and the year. We, we do talk about that quite often, but it's usually, um, I try to stay away from emails as much as I can. I check them in the morning as far as daily stuff, you know, just trying to be not react to stuff and just kind of push everything to the side, really focus on, on the important things of the week. And Bonnie, you mentioned, you know, the financials, which is a, a critical component of the growth of a firm and, you know, someone in your seat, you know, both of you need to be really keyed into that, of course. So, you know, that would be a question I would think that a younger engineer would have. I'm interested in ownership, leadership, but I don't know much, you know, I'm not very financially savvy, at least not at this point in my career. So, you know, Bonnie, did you, was there something that you needed to do, whether it was any kind of coursework or training, or was it just something you had to just kind of learn on the job in terms of the finances of the business? I would say a little bit both. Um, I got lucky enough to get involved into the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. So that was really phenomenal in that they taught me how to read um, all the financials of the company and how to present to a bank asking for loans if I needed it. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. And how to present to the bank and how to you know ask for a loan and prove to them that we had the capacity to pay back that loan through you know profit and loss statements or whatever we needed to do. Um, that's been part of it, you know, they teach you that, but then it's on the job training, you know, so if you're constantly looking at the numbers, you will be knowing those, those, um, income statements pretty, pretty much like the back of your hand. That's great. And how about you, Julia? Um, so I, I was pretty much self-taught, <laughs> uh, but early on, it was something I was always interested in. Uh, and since our company has been around for a long time and I'm only our second president, um, you know, we came from ledgers, like literally handwritten ledger financials through to, you know, when computers first came on the scene. Um, and so some of the financial backbone of the company was actually put in by me when I was a younger engineer, just because I had an interest in it. So I got a book on um, AE accounting and finance, and I read it and kind of figured out what an overhead rate is, how to calculate it, how to do, um, I started with projects on the project side then went to overhead rates and then um, sort of overall balance sheets, profit and loss. But it, it's kind of always been an interest, an interest for me. So that's kind of how I got into it. But, right. but now, but I mean, you are right. That is something a lot of people don't have. And recognizing that we have a, an associates program that we just started a couple of years ago. And when we bring people onto that program, whether or not they become a, a shareholder or not is a, a stepping stone towards that, but it's not a requirement. Um, I, I teach them 
the finances of the firm. So I show them what a balance sheet is using ours, um, what a profit and loss statement is, how to read it, what it means, how we um, generate our revenue, what accounts receivable are, all that stuff, so that they understand the finances behind the company. So if they do decide to invest and become a shareholder, they kind of they know more about what they're getting into. Hmm, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. So really giving people that opportunity. Yeah. So let's talk about Texas for a minute. <laughs> Texas is obviously a rather large state in, you know, in size and for that, well, not just for that reason, but for many reasons, I would say it's kind of like a, uh, in the terms of the civil engineering world, it's a, it's a big state. I mean, you know, there's a lot of land, there's a lot of roadways. I've been at Texas many times doing trainings and speaking. And a lot of times when I speak with civil engineers in Texas, there may be a recession going on in other parts of the country, but the civil engineering firms in Texas seem to stay relatively busy for, you know, maybe for some of these reasons, that's kind of what I want to talk to you both about. But um, Bonnie, let's go back to you on this one. How, how about your firm in terms of being busy, like over the years, um, being in Texas, being that there is a lot of work. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Texas is a great place to be for being busy as a civil engineer. There's just so many, you know, even through the reception and you heard about people, 1,200 people moving to the state a day, which was a crazy um, statistic in my mind. Um, you know, all those extra cars require extra roads to be built. And sure. the more and more people that come here, um, you know, more roads, more infrastructure, just across the board. Um, so I think, because the economy here in Texas, and Julia, I can't speak for you, I'm sure it's good there, but I mean, in Houston, it's, it's, it's very good. Yeah, and so since you've been building your company, Bonnie, have you seen, in terms of like workload and stuff, has, have you been relatively, you know, good or, you know, busy throughout? Yeah. Yes, um, we have been very busy, um, you know, I, I can say the proof of that is, you know, we've grown from five people to, to almost 30 in four and a half years. So it's been steady, um, wow. up and a little bit up and down, but no, it's been very busy. And then you have crazy natural events that happen like Hurricane Harvey, um, where, you know, has increased our workload some too. So. Sure. Yeah, sure. And, and Julie, how about you in the Austin area? Oh yeah. The Austin area is, is thriving. We're really, I'd say not just our firm, but pretty much all of the engineering firms here. The biggest thing holding us back is the ability to hire new folks in. Right. So for the most part, we're, you know, trying to get people to move here um, and uh, in order to, in order to hire them in because there's just the, uh, the unemployment rate for civil engineers in Austin is zero. <laughs> yeah. like every, if you do not have a job as a civil engineer in Austin, Texas, there's a problem. Right. As, as we're saying this, people are booking their uh, flights to Texas, relocate. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you, you, can, you can flash Bonnie and I's number on the bottom of the yeah. show. Yeah. Yes. In neon, neon letters. Yeah, because um, yeah, that's where I was going to go. That was like kind of what I was following up on was the hiring process. I mean, I would think for this, like a size of your firms, um, at the present level, you're, you're probably still like pretty involved in terms of hiring or looking at, you know, helping out in terms of, you know, where we need to hire. Um, is that something, Julie, that you're, you're focused on and you're working with your team on a lot in terms of hiring? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, this past year we kind of switched our thinking, uh, before we used to be pretty, I guess, you know, reactive. We'd wait until we had enough workload. You know, we, we, we take our hiring very seriously. We don't just step up and then let people go. When we hire somebody on, I have a hire for life philosophy. It's a little outdated, um, but I assume any, I assume, I mean, I've been here my whole career. I assume anyone I hire, I'm going to work with until I retire. That's just my assumption going in. So, you know, we don't step up for a job thinking, oh, well, you know, if we don't have the sustained workload, we can just let them go. That's just not how we operate. So for us to hire somebody in, you know, we need to be sure that we're going to be able to sustain that workload. So we used to be very reactive, you know, waiting for that workload to get to a certain level, but it takes so long to get the right person in. Um, you know, we won't just take any engineer. We're very protective of our culture. So we need to be sure we're bringing in the right, the right fit for us and for them. So it can take a really long time. So we made, um, you know, we intentionally this year decided we would be more proactive 
and start seeking out folks even ahead of when we thought we needed them. And we were still behind the curve. I mean, it still took us longer to bring folks in than um, the demand The demand became, um, was, was here before they were, <laughs> for sure. Mm-hmm. All right. The last question I have for both of you here, and then we'll, we'll jump into our, our uh, hot seat segment to talk a little bit about your careers. But Julia, for you, in terms of becoming president of the company, was it something that, you know, was a goal of yours early on in your career or was it something that evolved and happened over time? Oh, yeah. It, it was something I knew I wanted to do in high school. I mean, I didn't know I wanted to be a civil engineer when I was in high school, um, hence the original degree in architecture. Uh, but I always knew I wanted to own my own company. I assumed that I would have to start one from scratch, um, like Bonnie did. Hats off to you, because that's that's tough. Um, but that, that's what I assumed I would have to do. It did not. I did not realize going into even working um, here that it was a possibility to do within a firm that you could um, kind of you know rise through the ranks and become you know a principal of the firm, and then eventually take over as, as president. That wasn't something that I knew was an opportunity for me. I'm glad it worked out that way. Sure. Um, it just wasn't something I, I had planned on when I first started working here because I didn't realize that that was even something people did. All right. of my experience had been people starting from, from scratch. Okay, great. How about you, Bonnie? Um, you know, I think I realized that when, once I got my PE back in 2003, I just, quite honestly, I didn't do it sooner because I just couldn't get my head around the details. I just again, a lack of business knowledge. And, and I really wish that universities would have more push on the finance and, and the business ownership type curriculum going along with engineering. But, um, but it, yeah, it was in my head for some time. And I think that helped me in my career. Wherever I worked, I had the mentality of ownership. So that was good. But um, yeah, finally, right place, right time and right people to go into business with. And yeah, it was, it was great. But. Yeah. And I think it's great that you have both of you, the, the different ways that you did it because it's helpful. Mm-hmm. I think for the listeners to understand that there are different options. If you want to become a partner, owner, president, leader of a company, you know, there isn't, you don't have to just, you don't have to fa- find it, found a company yourself, you, but you can, or, you know, you might get into a company and grow with it. So there's different options. Like Bonnie said, depends on, place, time, you know, what's going on in your career, how your career unfolds. But, you know, based on the discussion that we're having here, there are many options for you if you're an entrepreneurial, if you're a leader. Um, So I think that that's important. All right. So we're going to switch over here to our civil engineering hot seat thing. We'll be back in just a minute and we'll, we'll pepper both of our presidents here with a couple of final career related questions. I hope you are enjoying this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast, which is produced by the Engineering Management Institute. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for more podcast episodes and for all of our Engineering Manager 8020 Shorts videos that we publish weekly where we interview successful engineering managers. Now it's time to jump into our Civil Engineering Hot Seat segment. All right, we're back on the Civil Engineering Podcast, back with Julia Harrod and Bonnie Moss, both presidents of civil engineering firms. And this is the first time that I'm putting two presidents on the civil engineering hot seat at the same time. So you both ready to go? We're ready. Ready. (laughs) All right. So Julia, you first. Is there any rituals that you have, routines every day, whether it's morning, lunchtime, end of your day, something that you do repeatedly uh, on a daily basis to help you or that's contributed to your success? Uh, yes. So I have a morning practice that I do. Um, I have a gratitude journal that I uh, write in and I write out my intentions for the day. Um, I look back on the last day. What are my you know, wins that I can take away from the last day? What are some things I could have done better? What are things I'm grateful for? And what are my intentions for that coming day? And I find it really um, centers me and also gives me a lot of focus for the day. Great. Bonnie, how about you? Any routines that you practice on a regular basis that have helped you? Yeah, absolutely. So whenever I meet with a client, um, I make a list of all the people I've met with, and then the next day I write a thank you note back to that client. It's the first thing I do in the morning because I think there's nothing better than starting your day 
um, and being grateful to people and them taking the time for you and giving you opportunities. That's great. Awesome. All right. So, so, so two awesome ones. I don't know if I've heard either one of those yet. So that's great. All right. So let's go now. I'll give this one to Bonnie for the second one. Bonnie, is there a book that you might recommend to engineers or not just engineers, but is there a book that, that you've read that has been very helpful to you either personally or professionally that just stands out when you think about some of your professional development? I would say from an entrepreneurial background spirit, uh, I would say E-Myth by Michael Gerber. You know, okay. it really talks in great depth about the technician turned business owner. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, E-Myth, uh, E-Myth is a great book and it is a, a book that does really focus on, you know, you, you get really good at something and then you start a business around it, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be really good at business. So um, it is very helpful. I, I'm a fan of that book myself and it is helpful if you're, if you're, if you're, you are entrepreneurial. Um, I think the example he uses was, you know, someone might bake really good pies and all their friends tell them that they should start going to the pie business. But the thing is, is that they're really good at making pies, not really good at building a business. So, um, so that's a good one for sure. How about you, Julia? Oh, wow. I've read so, so many books I could recommend. So I just um, finished actually the audio book for Dare to Lead by Brene Brown, which I thought was awesome. And if you're going to read the book, do the audio because she's just such a good storyteller. Um, it's like having her in your living room. Um, awesome. I, I found that to be very inspirational. So that was Dare to Lead? I think that right? that's what it's called, Dare okay. to Lead. All right, Brene Dare Brown. to Lead. Mm-hmm. We'll, uh, we'll link to these books in the show notes. All right, Julia, another one for you. You've had managers for sure, many or several different managers in your time as an engineer as, as you've grown through the ranks. If you had to think back on your managers, and, and I'm not asking either of you to name any <laughs> names, but if you thought of like your favorite manager or you know the best managers that you've had, right? What, what would, what makes them your favorite? What makes them like the best manager that you've had? What are, what is something that they did that really you remember, you know, now that you're president and you've had these mm-hmm. managers that have helped you to grow? Oh, um, really the, uh, managers that take time, that take time for you, you know, they not necessarily waiting for you. I mean, it's, it's great if you can go to your manager and be like, Hey, I need some time. I need some help. Um, but who can see that you're struggling and kind of come in and what can I do to help you? What do you need from me right now? You know, and kind of give you some advice and kind of point you in the right direction and then let you go off in that direction, maybe even stumble a little. I mean, not hold your hand the whole way, but just kind of point you in that direction, step back, watch you a little bit, and then kind of, you know, know that they're there to kind of help you if you do stumble. Great. Bonnie, how about you? Some of the some of the managers that you might remember, what was something that they did that that made them really stick out for you? I think just I think I remember my managers as I was a young EIT, just including me on the, the, the big picture. You know, taking me to the business development meetings when as an EIT at the time I didn't have a clue. Um, sharing with me the you know the finances of the company or just just you know like Julia said, taking the time for me and just being there for me. Um, and um, and I, I think, you know, just being there for me and knowing my family's names, you know, my kids' names, my husband's names, and just, just, just there personally as well as professionally. That's great. All right, so I've got one final question for both of you that we call the Civil Engineering Career elevator advice question. So I'll start with you, Bonnie. If you were to get into an elevator with a civil engineer, maybe they're up and coming in their career, they want to be a president one day or a leader one day in the field, and they have about 30 seconds with you, and you can give them some advice, what, what would you tell them? I would tell them to be sure to ask as many questions as possible. Hmm, that's great. And how about you, Julia? I'd say get involved in either your professional or your technical society. It made a huge difference for me being involved with the National Society of Professional Engineers for me in particular. It uh, just gives you a lot of opportunity to network, to meet other people, to see how other people lead, and to give you an, an, op- an opportunity to kind of test that out yourself on committees, et cetera. Okay, great. And because this is one of the episodes of our Women in Civil Engineering series, I'd like to add in one last question for both of you. You're both, you know, 
women leaders in our industry. You're president of companies and you've both been successful. And, you know, one of the reasons I started this series was my wife is also a civil engineer. And I know for her, you know, growing through her career, um, you know, sometimes it was a little bit, she lacked confidence a little bit, partly because there was a lot of men in the industry in the field. And so I just wondered if each of you, as we close out here, could just maybe, um, you know, give a message to those women in civil engineering that are out there, they're building their careers. Maybe they want to be where you are someday in terms of president of a company, leader of a company. Um, you know, Julia, is there something you could offer to them if they're listening to this episode? Hmm. That's a really good, a really good question. I, um, I feel, I feel for your wife. I would say that, you know, they call it imposter syndrome. Um, everybody has it, um, at some point in time in their career. I bet the guys do too, and they just don't talk about it as much. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's always that time. If you're stretching and you're growing, there's going to be a time where you're sitting in a meeting and everyone's talking about something and you're thinking, Oh my gosh, they're going to ask me a question and I'm not going to know the answer. And you know, that's okay. You can just say, I'm going to check in on that and I'm going to get back to you. And just to have that confidence and, um, and maybe really just surround yourself with people that, you know, have your back. So you can go back to the office and be like, Hey, I was just in this weird situation where they're asking me all these questions. I don't know the answer. What do I do? And, you know, have some folks that can really mentor you and, and take you through that and step you up in your career. Awesome. How about you, Bonnie? I just think that, you know, I would, the advice I would give is just be, be confident where you are. Mm -hmm. You're smart enough that you got to this point. And, and actually, you know, whether you're male or female, it's, a, it's really a non-issue. And if, yep. once you have that mindset, it being a non-issue, you just, you just go, you know, and know that it's the, being a female civil engineer is probably to your advantage because, you know, you're, you're authentic, you know, you, you're authentic when you lead and when you follow and, um, and yeah, it's just, I think it's just, that's the mentality and the mindset you have to have. Have that confidence and both of you kind of give them the same the same idea there of having confidence, right? Be yourself, mm -hmm. have confidence, stick with it. Even if there are times to get tough and really all of our listeners, it doesn't matter. Like Bonnie said, you know, men, women, we all go through the ups and downs of the engineering world. Um, for many reasons, our projects are complex. We deal with a lot of different types of people on a lot of different types of projects. And, you know, <clears throat> I believe in just doing what we do at EMI that, the number one, I mean, you could build every skill in the world, but if you're not confident, it really doesn't matter. And, and that's, that's the key thing. So Julia Harrod, Bonnie Moss, both leaders in the civil engineering world and some of the busiest civil engineering cities right now in the United States. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to spend some time here on the civil engineering podcast. It was a, it was a really pleasure to spend some time with both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. It was great. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast on YouTube produced by the Engineering Management Institute. We're always looking for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.